Also check the condition of your drive belts. A good way to test the tension, at least how I do it, if you can turn the belt about 90 degrees and you really have to turn hard to get it past 90 degrees, then the tension usually is about right. It's kind of a good rough gauge. And then also you want to look at the ribbed surface of the belt and make sure that there's not cracks running across all the ribs. You may find little tiny cracks uh, here and there on some of the ribs, but if you see cracks straight across all the ribs, then that's a very weak point and that belt is likely to break. This is the timing belt cover. Ask about when the last time the timing belt was changed and don't take their word for it. Ask to see the actual receipt. Timing belts on some models, if they break, will destroy the engine. And also replacing the timing belt can be really expensive, 700 maybe over $1,000. So if they change the timing belt, there will usually be a sticker on the top of the timing cover that will tell you the mileage and the date that the timing belt was changed. So you can use that as a reference too. Check that your battery terminals are clean and tight. That can often explain problems with starting or keeping the engine running or any kind of charging problems. All right, and the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually remove the oil cap, and I'm going to look under the cap and see if there's any um, really funky-looking mud, like white milkshake kind of thing that would indicate possible busted head gasket. Um, because of uh, coolant mixing with the oil. I'm also going to try to look in there and see if I can see, and it just looks like regular clean oil, so that's looking pretty good. And I think at this point we're going to go and uh, go into the interior of the car and start checking around a little bit. All right, at this point I'm going to take the key for my personal car, not for the car I'm buying, but for the car that I drove up there with, and I'm going to see if I can start the car and I cannot. If you can start the car with the key not designed for the car, then that indicates that you need to walk away because that is not right. Obviously, if you see that the, uh, they've broken open the steering column or something like that, that goes without saying. But this is a good way to see if they've you know, been a little bit more sneaky about it and that any key will start the car. So now what I'm going to do, it's a very important step here. I'm going to take the key, of course, for the car, and I'm going to turn it to on. I am not going to start the car. I'm just going to turn it to on. And what I'm looking for are these dummy lights that hopefully you can see lit up. What I'm really looking for is the check engine light, the SRS, or the airbag light, and the oil light. Also, there will usually be the seat belt light and maybe a door open light because you might have the door open, but the check engine light, the SRS light, and the oil light, most important ones. If you don't see those come on, then either there's been some kind of tampering, maybe the bulb is out, but it could be an indication of a very serious problem. So make sure that those lights go on. Obviously, also when you start the car, they should all go off. Now this one I know has a check engine light problem, so the check engine light won't go off, but at the very least, make sure that those bulbs are working. This is very important. If the check engine light does not come on when you turn the key to the on position, you have no way of knowing if you've got a check engine light problem, especially if you don't have a code scanner, and it could be a very serious thing. As a matter of fact, just fixing the check engine light not coming on itself could be more serious than any problem that might have been trying to be hidden. So always do that. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to head, go ahead and start the car and I'm going to test every single possible accessory that I can think of. Everything from the horn to the wipers to the power mirrors, if it has power seats, the radio, make sure the air conditioning works, make sure that the heating works. I'm going to make sure that the flashers, all power windows, make sure because a lot of times the rear power windows don't work on the older cars. You'll want to check everything possible that you can see in front of you and make sure that it works. And also, don't forget to check to make sure that you've got the seat belts and that the seat belts are um, correct and that they, they lock in tight and everything. Again, part of this is preparing for your test drive. Another good thing to check before the engine warms up, right after you start it, is to squeeze the radiator hoses. If before the engine even starts getting warmed up, the hoses start getting really, really hard, that is a good indication that you've got either a cylinder head problem or a cracked cylinder. And what's happening is gases from the engine are getting into the cooling system and they're creating that really, really high pressure. So that's something to check before the engine fully warms up. 
And it goes without saying, if there's any loud knocking or really loud ticking sounds when the engine is running, then the only other sound you should be hearing is your tires squealing as you run for your life from that car. There should be no knocking sounds. Don't be talked into anything like, oh, it just started doing that, or, oh, it's fine, we drive it like that all the time. Knocking sounds are really bad. I do have a knocking engine knock video that you might want to listen to and get a feel for the sound of the engine knock that you're looking for. And usually along with that, when you look at the oil, it'll be real silvery and glittery uh, because of fine metal, metal particles, because of the worn bearings. But uh, basically, any engine knock, just don't even think about it. Walk away from it. This is also a good time to check the odometer, make sure that it's as advertised by the seller. Make sure that the wear in the vehicle seems to match the odometer. If the odometer on a car is only 50,000 miles, but you can see the seats are completely wore out, the gas pedal is completely flattened out and worn and all the rubber's worn off, then that's not indicative of a 50,000 mile car. Normally the car would be running at this time, but you know I don't want to talk over the engine. I know that my audio sucks. I know, I know the camera sucks and the lighting, but you know, this, I don't do this for a living. So um, the other thing that I want to do while this is running, I want to make sure that I'm keeping an eye on the temperature gauge. One of the most important things, make sure you're not overheating the car, especially an older one like this. So really always keep an eye on the temperature gauge and also for any oil light that might be coming on while the car is running. While the car is running, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and turn the heater on, make sure that the frost works, the heat works. And I'm also going to reach down and I'm going to feel all around the carpet and I'm going to feel if it's wet. If I feel that the carpet is wet or damp or anything like that, that could be indicative of a leaking heater core. Those are a real pain in the butt. You'll know because it'll be really oily on your fingers. If you feel that, then you're going to have a fairly difficult, or if you're not going to do it yourself, an expensive repair with a heater core if you feel coolant in the carpet. And the final thing I always like to do, I like to open the glove box and see if there's any documents in there, like repair documents. Um, I actually had a time when uh, the person said that the air conditioner worked fine. I found that the air conditioner didn't work. They were shocked about it. But then I found a repair bill for the air conditioner where they declined the repair right in the glove box. Um, the other thing is sometimes you can find some money. I found a dime. I can use that towards the purchase of the car. All right, by this time the car should be pretty sufficiently warmed up. And again, you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on that temperature gauge. And uh, by the way, if the car didn't warm up at all and it never brought heat or anything, then you probably have a thermostat problem. Real easy fix, but again, something you might be able to use to negotiate. But at this point, uh, with the car warmed up, we're going to start doing some tests to try to find anything that would make it very obvious that we're not even going to bother with the test drive. The first thing that I do is I take off the oil cap again. And I'm going to look under again, make sure, and I'm going to do this quick because while the engine's running, this could be a little messy. Um, so I'm going to look under, make sure that there's no evidence of coolant in there. And I'm going to hold my hand over the hole and feel the blow-by. And um, most older cars, you're going to feel some puffs coming out of there. And that's perfectly normal. On some models, it's more normal than others. But you just don't want it to be really, really strong. And you definitely don't want to see puffs of white smoke like it's a choo-choo train or something. Um, that, that is generally a bad sign. That generally indicates coolant uh, being cooked in there. Don't spend too long doing this, though, because it's going to fling oil out at you on most models. And then, of course, that causes some smoking. And then you and the owner get into a little tiff there. Um, another way, uh, and actually maybe even a better way if you can do it, to check blow-by is if you can reach your finger onto the dipstick hole of the uh, oil dipstick. And if you feel it really pushing your finger off, that's usually a bad sign. Um, sometimes you'll even notice that the dipstick just pops right off if the blow-by is too strong. Um, on this particular car, again, I don't have the engine running, but it didn't have very bad blow-by at all. But good God, it smelled like raw fuel. It really did. So clearly the engine's running really, really rich. It also, um, I I believe earlier I mentioned that the oil kind of had a fuel smell to it. So there's clearly some raw fuel going through here. I don't know if it's a misfire or what. Again, I'll look at that on my scan tool. You probably won't have one. But you can kind of smell the blow-by, see if it smells really, really gasoline-like or really, really exhaust-like, like if it's from your tailpipe on a, on a car. Um, that might indicate worn exhaust valves, that kind of thing. But I do like the blow-by test. It's a real easy way to get um, just a quick rough indication of the engine health. Now this is something I want to show here. Uh, these letters here are upside down, but what they read are UPAP. 
and that's going to stand for you pull and pay. And what that means is that this valve cover, or possibly, possibly even maybe the whole engine, is from a junkyard. And actually, uh, you might think that's just an instant deal breaker. They're using junkyard parts on this. You know, on a car this age, a 96 at this price, that's not that uncommon. And I even had a truck once where I rebuilt the engine using many different junkyard parts from several different models even, and even different junkyards. And it runs perfectly fine. Again, I'm not going to be emotional about it. I'm going to believe um, a compression test at this point, but this is this is a bit of a flag, no question about it. Uh, you know, the car's not probably been taken care of by a professional mechanic, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, you need to use some judgment. Right now, every indication is that the engine's in good shape and stuff, so um, it may be that this junkyard engine has half the miles of the original one. Maybe this is a better thing, but again, I'm just going to go off the data, but this is something I'm going to bring up with the owner for sure, and I'm going to use this in negotiating um, to leverage a better price, and I'm going to insist that um, I probably go ahead and do a field compression test now because I'm a little concerned because of this junkyard thing going on, so that's something to watch out for. Now, contrary to that, I can see there's a brand new alternator on here, and uh, everything else does look to be in very good condition. So um, again, I am uh, not going to be too freaked out about that. But one of the other things I want to do, again, we want to make sure I don't die on the road. I'm going to get my voltmeter here. And again, while the engine running, I'm going to test at the battery and make sure I've got over 14 volts. That indicates that the alternator is working. And on this car, it is. Again, I'm not running the engine right now because I don't want to talk over it. And at this point, I'm pretty satisfied that if we test drive this vehicle, we're not going to end up stranded. Again, that's, that's uh, for not only my protection, but also for the owner as well, because we don't want to get in an argument over who's responsible for towing the car, that kind of thing. So I'm going to make sure that I've got everything back the way I had it. But because of this... Um, used car or used engine possibility here. I, I want to do one thing and again your seller may or may not be very amenable to doing this but I really would feel more comfortable doing a compression test on this thing. So um, most likely they're not going to let you go ahead and do like a field compression test but there is something that you may be able to do um, that, that can actually serve very very well as a, a field compression test on the fly and that is to disable the ignition and then try to start the car. Obviously it won't start, but by ear you'll be able to tell whether you've got good compression or not. I'm going to go ahead and do that for you. I'm going to go ahead and disable the ignition and um, I'm going to show you what it sounds like when you've got good compression or at least not necessarily good compression but even compression which is more indicative of good compression versus a clear you've got to walk away from the car compression problem. So let me go ahead and set that up. Alright, so what I've done on this model is I've disabled the ignition. Again, either you can unplug the coil or you can take out all the spark plug wires. Make sure you know where they go back in. On this model, it's really easy. It's just four cylinders, so not too much to remember where things go. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, after disabling the ignition, I'm going to try to start the car, and I want you to take a listen to how even the starting pattern is. You'll see what I mean in a second. All right, hopefully you heard how even that was. And uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and loosen a spark plug to create a compression leak. And this is going to simulate a car that has bad compression. And go ahead and take a listen now, and you're going to clearly see the difference. Now, hopefully you were able to hear the difference on that. And that is the sound of you walking away from this car, unless you're trying to buy it as a project or a repair to flip or something like that. But uh, to me, that sound is really, really obvious. Uh, hopefully it is to you, too. But if you hear that sound on a car, that is a bad compression in a cylinder. And unless tightening the spark plug fixes it or something, uh, it's time to walk away. Now, obviously, not every car owner is going to let you go ahead and do what we just did here or even hook up a compression gauge. Um, actually, obviously, I'm going to hook up a compression gauge on this car because it's in my garage. But if the owner of the car is nice enough to let you go ahead and do these kind of extreme tests, you got to show them some respect because this is really helping you out, and it's a huge advantage over anyone else who's buying a car that doesn't get to do these things. So make sure you put everything back the way it was. If you end up not buying the car, you don't want to leave the owner in a harder position to sell the car because now you broke a spark plug wire or something like that. Um, so, you know, show them some respect because it's really cool if they let you do this kind of stuff.